Uh, how, how many of you took an opportunity to be part of the Day of Caring event this, this last Wednesday? All right, got some folks right there in the back. I know we had seven people that were working hard getting things done in two different sites. We still have one site we've got to help uh, finish that couldn't get all the stuff uh, set up before uh, Wednesday. So one more. I could not have done this job by myself. I get a chance to do some things besides just our team. But on the Day of Caring, which was Wednesday the 15th, my wife noticed it was the second time in 31 years of anniversaries that I was doing Day of Caring on our anniversary. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I, it was probably not the best uh, scheduling, but I'm not in charge of that. But anyway, in 1,216 different people across the county worked on 130 projects fixing homes and yards and schools and all kinds of opportunities to touch you know organizations and households and families it was a lot of fun there were football teams out there and basketball teams out there and cheerleading teams out there and then a bunch of old guys like me and we went out there and we did what we could do and we had a really good time with it now in doing so I was coming back from uh, you know a, a long day we started early setting up our church tent at the, the city park you know about eight o'clock and then I was coming back racing towards the church about 6.30 after all the, the, the last minute, you know, running the, uh, the debrief. And I started thinking about something. Um, if you think about it, there was so many things going on. I had just left this meeting where we were having a great time talking about what we'd seen and what we'd learned and the neat stories of homeowners coming out and being so thankful. In fact, I heard a funny one. These Rotarians were, were uh, building ramps for some people that have mobility issues and they did three ramps across the county. And one of them, they ran out of the balusters you put in uh, the railings and they, so they left the balusters out of one section and they thought, oh, we never run out. And the homeowner came out and it was you know, a lady that was a little crippled and she looked at it and she said, that's so perfect. You left it open where I get into my crawl space. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, we, uh, we, we just total mistake, but a mistake in the right place, right? So I mean, just it, it worked out, you know. And it was a lot of fun. So we have all these great stories, and I'm driving back and thinking about church and what we have to do, and, and I'm just looking to the sides of the road, and something hit me. There was no evidence at 6:30 that it had ever happened. No, that makes sense, right? I mean, all the job sites were closed down. All the volunteers had gone home or gone on to other things like church. And, and I get that, that. That's normal. But imagine for a second, there were a lot of people that had no idea that it had ever happened at all. And I'm not worried about that or bummed about that or chewing anybody about that. It was just an observation. How many of you ever realized there's lots of stuff going on all around you that you're not plugged into so you know nothing about it? So I started kind of doing the math, right? How many people have an idea? How many residents are there in Livingston County? A lot. What's that? About 180 now, Nick. But, but you're, you're close. Nick, Nick wins the award for being close. So about 180,000 people live here, right? You don't really notice that just going down your street. How many of you live on dirt roads and in corners of the county one place or another? So yeah, if you do, you might not think that at all. But you, you start adding it all together, about 180,000. Well, we, might, we had about 1,216 volunteers and we reached out to homes and schools. We might have involved 3,000 people that day. But 3,000 people is less than 2% of the population of Livingston County. So, I mean, population-wise, most people don't even know what's going on. If you didn't drive by and see a group of people doing something, you would not have known the day even took place. And 70% of the residents of the county that worked, they worked outside the county in the beginning. So they were gone when we started, and they came back and we were gone. No connection at all. It's easy to not know what's going on if you're not plugged in. Now, I'm not here preaching about why you should be plugged into Day of Caring or why you should be plugged into... No. I'm just talking about the idea of being plugged in at all. Anywhere. So I started thinking about it. How easy is it in our society to not have spiritual connections that help us be plugged into what we need? Amen. Right? Now, I'm going to be a lot wider than you think. This isn't just a come to church thing. How many of you know that it helps to have that as a spiritual community? But if you, you should have spiritual communities that do take you a little farther than just the walls or, or the, the roster list of this church. You should be connected to other people. And by the way, you are connected to more than those who are spiritually connected to God. Right? How many of you work with people who don't know Jesus, wouldn't know Jesus if you walked in? Right? You, they're great people. You love them. You have fun with them. They're just, they're just not part of the world. Okay? So we are connected. So you have to ask yourself, what am I doing with my connections? 
And if I'm not connected in the right ways or to the right people, will I grow or will I fade in my faith? How do those connections affect me? So as I started thinking about those questions, I started thinking first about the disciples. Now, each of the Gospels deals with events in a slightly di different fashion, right? I mean, you've noticed that. Does Luke sound like Mark? Deals with the same events, but they don't sound the same. I've used this before. Why? They're talking to different people. Talking to different audiences. Mark is like a sports writer. I always call Mark the bitch album of scripture. That's my line. You've heard me use it before. It, you know, it's short and sweet. We get, we get miracle after, I mean, it looks like Jesus just had this lineup of miracles day after day after day, just doing miracles constantly. How many of you know he did a lot of teaching and there was things in between the miracles in three years? But if you read Mark, it's like, Whoa, he packs it all together like a garbage compactor, a miracle compactor, you know, and you get these 16 short chapters and boom, it's one revelation of power. Why Mark is talking largely to Gentile Romans. And Romans like power. Romans want to worship a God that can get things done. And so Mark is saying, hey, look, and he's not making anything up. He's telling the truth, but he's packing it all together. You don't need to fill in in between. Let's just get the miracles. Luke is a doctor. Luke is analytical. Luke is speaking to a mixed group of Jews and Gentiles. Luke is very, he's giving you, so you get a whole lot more expansion between miracles and depth of teaching and, because it's a different thing. Okay, I get that. That happens. The audience matters. You think about, though, as you read any of the Gospels, think about the group of people that we call the disciples or the apostles. And how many of you know those two are not the same thing? How many of you know every apostle was a disciple, but not every disciple was an apostle? Okay, I have to cut drawing that, that, that line because there, there is a difference. There are 12 of these people, a select group that's called primarily because Jesus sees something in them. Jesus wants to draw something out of them to be used as leadership of the early church. It's great. So we see apostles doing things that not all disciples do. How many of you know he gave them power and sent them out on on-the-job training exercises? Kind of like what you got a chance to do with taking people out, Rick, all those of you who went out to the, you know, the, the motel area. Jesus said, go out. There it is. Get it done. And anointed them with power to do it. Good. But I, I, as I see these two groups, think about it for a second. Jesus is building his church and he's got to start with leadership. How many of you would be really picky about your leaders? How many of you would really want to like, see a resume? And you'd want to see their experience. How many of you would pick people who already had this religious thing down? If you were trying to get religious leadership for your new thing, you want to make sure that they understood it. Is that who he picked? Okay, so maybe, maybe he didn't pick you know, leaders who were necessarily brilliant leaders and phenomenally religiously trained. But once you get those people, you can send them to school, right? How many of you that would be the kind of the natural thing? Send them to school, get them trained. Any of you ever have to be trained on a machine? Trained in a process? Right? So they focus you. Your, your job sends you to you know, help with, uh, with the, the uh, kidney function, you know, dialysis. Thank you. I, I knew the word was escaping me. Right? Okay? Or, or, or whatever it was. Whatever business function. So right, Jesus took all these apostles and he put them in this place where they could just focus on learning. Right? Not exactly. He did something different with them. And as it connected in my head, I was like, oh, well, that's pretty cool. First of all, I want to show you the, in these two passages that we're not talking about the same group. Look at Luke 8.1. Luke 8.1. 8.1, no, 6.1. Put on your glasses, Jeff. 6.1. Makes sense. Otherwise, you'll say, what are you talking about? In Luke 6, 1, it says, Now it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields, and his disciples plucked the head of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And his disciples. How many of you have ever thought, that's just the twelve? It's Jesus and the twelve, and they're just all following along, and just the twelve of them are picking grain. Did you ever realize that it was a bigger group than the twelve? Why do I say that? Look down a little farther. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. Not very far along. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray, and he continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve. 
whom he also named apostle. And if you go down, you see them. Simon also named Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew. The whole list goes on. He picked the 12 out of a bigger group. So he didn't start on day one of ministry going to collect the best and the brightest and training them in functions, and then they went out and got other people. He started with community first. He concerned himself with plugins first. So when he actually went and called Peter from the fishing boats, and when he called Andrew, and when he called the rest of them, he didn't call them specifically and immediately to be Christian leaders and fill a role. He called them to exist first in a community. And out of that community, he saw them rising to another position fulfilling a specific role. So what's more important, the role or the community that came first? It's a good question, isn't it? I think in Western Christianity, we get so locked into this idea that the role somebody has matters more. Oh, they're really good at greeting. They're really good at administration. They're really good at this particular gift. Jesus didn't start with the gifts. He might have, I'm sure he knew them. I mean, he saw into their hearts, right? He saw into their minds. He got what they could do. But he wasn't going, hmm, first thing I need to do is get you to do this thing. He said, the first thing I need to do is have you be part of this family. Be plugged into this community. Do you realize how much easier it is to lead a community when you know who the people are that is in the community? Amen. You know how much easier it is to care about what's going on when you've been a part of it yourself? Community predates role. Now I want to ask you, what are, the, what are the things that plugging in connections, family bring about? I started to look at that. If Jesus was trying to do this, again, you think he would go back to qualities and other things. Instead he said, I need you in community because it builds things in you. Here's the first. Accountability. What's Accountability. Yeah, Dave. Uh, just help uh, putting them to uh, a standard or a set of rules and everything and keeping people, um, I wouldn't say accountable, but I mean, like keeping them uh, basically in check with, uh, from not being above the, the law or the rules. Okay, keeping people in check, helping them to, to know they're not above the law or the rules, that's good. Now, now, Megan, when do you leave for North Central? Friday. Friday. We're going to pray for you at the end of the service. Please let's remember to do that as, as she gets kind of commissioned and sent off, and, and that'll be cool. But she's getting ready to leave, and she has an accountability program. It's called Grades. Right? And she'll do fine, because she's a smart girl. But I mean, if you think about it, you don't just go to college and they throw you in this room and they say, good luck. I mean, you know, they, they, they take your money for a reason. And, and then they want to say, this is how you're doing it. You're studying right. You're understanding the right things. You're, you're, you're telling us the right things. Yay, team. How many of you ever had grades you've had to deal with? Accountability. Okay, it matters. Open to Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. We'll see something to do with accountability. I love this story, but maybe for re reasons that you're not thinking of. Matthew 20, 20 and following says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two perfect sons, I added the word perfect, perfect sons of mine, may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. How many of you know that has something to do, it has more to do with than seating assignments? What is sitting on the right hand and the left hand of Jesus in his kingdom supposed to say? Power, authority, clout, status. Let them be the two most special dudes in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Did Jesus know what baptism he was talking about? Did the disciples have a clue yet? I mean, he'd been trying to tell them, but they honestly, they didn't have a clue yet. They said to him, we are able. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup 
and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to give. It is for those whom it, for whom it is prepared by my Father. Now if you stop right there, I have a question to ask. How many of you have ever tried something on for size? Tried to see what you could get away with? What's that? Oh, okay. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> How many? What have you ever tried on for size? Oh. Cool. Well, that's a good thing. You should try those on. Anything else? Speeding. Speeding. Okay. How many of you have ever said, I can get away with that here? Nobody will be paying attention here. Oh, okay. I mean, that's happened, right? I mean, how many of you have ever figured that there were ways at work to cut corners? And if you cut corners, maybe it's more profitable. If you cut corners, maybe it's easier. Maybe it'll be quicker. You know, maybe the, the boss doesn't really pay attention to that. What, what, if you have one bad unit among 5,000, who cares? You know what I mean? So, so I, we've tried things on for size. I think it's pretty normal. That's kind of human nature. It's not right. I'm not saying, Pastor did not say, go ahead and try things on for size. I'm just saying you're likely to. And so am I. John and James are trying something on for size, aren't they? I mean, are there helicopter parents? Yes. Is it possible that James and John were just under the thumb of their mommy and this was all mommy driven? It's possible. But how many of you realize that was a little less common back then than maybe it is in our modern society? James and John were adults. They were business owners. They were running fishing boats. They probably weren't just like, yes, mama, I'll do whatever you want. I'm kind of guessing that they might have been using mama to try this one on for size. You know, we know this Jesus guy and we really like him and we're following him and we really believe in what he's doing. And you know what? Mom, would you help us? We think maybe he'll be more willing to listen. I don't know that for sure. The Bible doesn't tell us. But I do find it interesting. This is the only situation where Mama's trying to take care of this issue. So I think these guys are trying it on for size. Let's see. Maybe we'll get lucky. Maybe she'll ask and Jesus will say, oh, right, you are my lieutenants. You are the ones. And so they kind of tried it on for size. Did it work? No. In fact, this is a perfect illustration of watch what you ask for, you might get it. Isn't it? Can you handle the baptism? Can you handle the cup? Yeah, we can do it. Okay, you'll have to do it now. How many of you know that was rough? And they didn't go out easy. Yeah, rough, rough situation. But listen, this is why I say there's benefits for accountability in a family, in community. Read a little farther. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Now, if you try something on and it doesn't work, but nobody else other than you know that it doesn't work, might you try it on again? <laughs> How many of you have ever been speeding and you got away with it? How many of you have been speeding and got away with it and figured you'd try it on again? <laughs> How many of you have ever been single and speeding and got a ticket for it, but hey, it was just you, right? And so it was no big deal, and you tried it on again. How many of you have ever been, you know, had a family and financial pressure and got a ticket that you don't raise your hand and needed to pay for, and you had to come home and admit to the rest of the family that that's where the money went? Is that a higher level of motivation not to go back and speed there again? Maybe not to speed at all? Yes! So these two guys, James and John, they could have just come to, uh, you know, and said, hey, we tried it. We tried the left and right thing. Didn't work. You know, maybe we'll get it. Maybe the father will pick that for us. But yeah, nothing ventured, nothing gained. But they had to come back into community. And at least the other ten in the, 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 in the inner circle, they did not like the fact that these two decided to shoot for the number one and number two spot. So what happens? They were greatly displeased with them. And Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. 
So in community, plugged into the right things, Jesus even takes the errors of people who are trying it on for size and he holds them to account and he teaches them something better. This isn't about what you can get away with. It's about how you can be a blessing to others. Oh. So it's not just, ouch. It's actually a learning. So you can do it better next time. There's accountability. How many of you know accountability is a good thing, but it's an uncomfortable thing? Can I be honest? Some people really avoid spiritual community. And they do it on purpose. They might tell you, it's because I got hurt. Yeah, there are people that got hurt. If you've been hurt, I am sorry you've been hurt. But how many of you know that that's not the major reason why people duck community? They duck it because they don't like accountability. Somebody might ask why I did or didn't do. And I'm not just about church. This could be your Christian friends. This could be family members who love God. If you're not plugged into them, they won't ask you anything. If you're plugged in, they'll ask. And sometimes that can be uncomfortable. So it's easy to keep a little bit of a distance. Accountability is amazingly important. Second, community, being plugged in, brings us encouragement. Look at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4, verse 36. Now this is something that could also be used as an example, but example, an example is another thing I'm going to talk about, but I'm dealing with that a little differently. Acts 4, 36 and 37 says, And Joseph, who is also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. Forget the financial thing. I'm not taking an offering afterwards. Don't worry about it. Just want to look at the idea of encouragement. Now, how many of you think of encouragement as a warm hug when you're having a bad day? And that's a good part of encouragement, by the way. And how many of you know if you're lonely, if you are cut off from people who understand what God is doing, if you're cut off, it is a lot harder to get encouragement out of a community you don't have, even if that's the encouragement you're talking about. If there's nobody around to give you a warm hug on a bad day, you don't get one. You have to hug yourself. Doesn't do as much, does it? I mean, they make coats to let you do that all day. Wouldn't recommend wearing one. But there's more to encouragement in community than just feeling good on a bad time. That matters and it's important. And if you are an encourager, God bless you. But in this case, Barnabas was not going around saying, oh, you poor people, let me show you what God can do with my wealth. That wasn't the point. He wasn't promising that they'd be wealthy too. It didn't matter what the wealth was. He just, I had stuff. And he decided to sell it. And he decided to give that money that came from that stuff for the cause of spreading the gospel. How does encouragement work that way? If it's not just a warm hug on a bad day, what's encouragement like in this case? You're thinking hard. You can hear the gears. Yeah, Roberta. Yeah. Okay, it's showing you what can be done, isn't it? That's really what he's doing. He was calling people. It's, it's like running. How many of you have ever done track? I haven't. Okay. Isn't it, when you get other people around you and they're, they're yelling and they're screaming, you can do it. Have you ever found a little bit more speed? Yeah. You get together a little bit more speed, a little bit more faith, a little bit more desire to live right, a little bit more trust that God can heal, a little bit more focus on sharing your faith. If you're not all by yourself, if you've got spiritual communities around you, you can get it done. Jason, he, Jason loves going into schools and sharing the message, and he's very, very good at it. I've watched him do it. But I tell you what, I think one of the things that helps you, he has talent, he has skill, you got all that down, Jason, but I think your team helps you. If you had to go and set up all that equipment yourself, and you had, which you could do, I know you could do, maybe you've done it, <laughs> yes, and you have to go face 1,000 or 2,500 students who aren't sure about faith at all, and you've got to carry the whole thing on your shoulders, maybe you could do it, but isn't it easier to have your people around you? And they pray together with you, and they set up stuff with you, and they strategize with you, and they get ready to run follow-up afterwards with you. 
when you are plugged into a spiritual community of accountability, you have encouragement. You start to see what God can do in you and how it can work and why it can work. If you're all by yourself, you do not get that. Third, a community brings teaching. The advantage of the community, this advantage might sound strange to some, but we got to talk about it. Most of the time when we talk about teaching, we think about pastors or elders or somebody, again, has that role, has that particular gift. How many of you feel like you're not primarily a teacher? A few of us? You know what? Every one of you that just raised your hand, I'm not saying this is some generic pat on the back, you're all smart people. I've seen what you can do and the talents and the gifts that you have. But you're saying, I just don't feel like I'm going to Okay, doesn't that often mean I'm not sure I could run a class? I'm not sure I always know how to organize all the material to, to sit down with 10 or 30 people and try to get it all done. It's not about what you don't know. It's simply about maybe that level of confidence. Most Christians feel that they never teach and they don't feel they always have the skills or the desires to do so. And yet, if the only teaching you got was me, or Pastor Brian, or the occasional speaker, how much teaching would you get? Not much. 35, 40 minutes, once a week. If you come on a Wednesday, you get a little bit more, but you know, right? Not a lot. How many of you get more news than that? How many of you get more internet than that? How many of you get more music in your car than that on your commute? How many of you, you I'm going to be honest and maybe a little bit gross, how many of you go to the bathroom longer than that in a week? <laughs> you, you do, right? I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not whipping anybody. It's just true. It, 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 the life is busy. And, and <laughs> of all the community that you have, all the teaching that you have is that which is formally given to you by somebody who wears a title somewhere. You don't have much. But if you can sit on a beach with your friend and you can talk about faith, you're actually teaching each other. If you can, just like in Day of Caring, get together and you're doing projects with somebody and you're learning about their attitude. Don, if you're sitting there and you're, you're talking about glass and wire twisting and all the things that you do in your art, you teach each other, don't you? So you're plugged into an artistic community and you're plugged into to friends that like beaches and you're, you're plugged into craftsmen who like working uh, on projects. Great! If you're plugged into a spiritual family in a community, you find you teach each other a lot. And you teach each other things that, quite frankly, I can't. How many of you know that there... This is an easy one. How many of you have ever heard me preach a sermon that meant nothing to you at the moment? Come on, be honest. <laughs> right? You know, it might be the gospel, I understand that. I mean, I hope I delivered it halfway decently, but it just wasn't where you were at the moment. That wasn't what you were worried about. That wasn't your main concern. And, and so, unless you're one of these really detailed note takers that puts it all away and knows where to find it, I've got all kinds of notes on sermons I have no idea where they are anymore. Okay. How many of you ever been there? Right? So I can preach something to you that goes, what? I mean, it's not that you're not intelligent, it's just not, not where you are. Okay. But maybe your friend talking to you over the job or sitting out in the backyard tells you exactly what you need at that moment. So you know what? You all are teachers. But until you're plugged into that spiritual family and community, you're not sharing it the way you should or can. You're not getting it the way you should or can. Accountability, encouragement, teaching, the last one. Example. Okay? And that one, by the way, in Acts 15, I'll show you the illustration. Acts 15, 5. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying it is necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and the elders came together to consider the matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us, and that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we should be saved in the same manner as they. 
Do you realize that this really wasn't a formal type of a tea? They weren't sitting down in a lecture hall. This was leadership all sitting around talking about, do we take these dirty, rotten Gentiles or not? And they started sharing from their experience. Peter didn't open and say, the Bible says an XYZ PDQ. He said, listen, I, I was called to a bunch of Gentiles home. And I talked. And they got filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of you realize that is teaching on a person-to-person -person basis? Sharing experience. If you're teaching somebody how to make cookies, or build a shed, or showing them how your prayer life has changed you, you are teaching, and you're doing it in community. Then the last one, Matthew 14, verse 25. And this is example, which I'm going to call a combination of the above three. Examples are visual demonstrations of all this stuff combined. When people show us a good example, they call us to be accountable to do the same. When people show us a good example, they encourage us to stretch beyond what we're doing right now. When people show a good example, they teach us what we do not know and help make us stronger. Examples tie it all together. How many of you know that even bad examples teach us something? That's right. Give you a great bad example. Jeff saw it. And Charlene. Je well, no, you weren't the bad example. So, so we're doing this project, right? And the ladies had been working on the steps. And at the last minute, we realized we had to paint these pillars up on the porch. And we could, the lady didn't have a ladder, so we couldn't do it from the outside. So we had to get up on the porch so we could be tall enough to paint it. So I, Jeff was working on something. I figured I'd go up there. Somebody passed me a brush. So I, I found a way to finagle my way up onto the, the, the top of the porch. And then Jeff came up and did all the actual painting while nobody gave me a brush. But anyway, <laughs> so Fred and Dottie had to leave, and they said, well, you're going to have to move your car. Now, Amanda Jones very kindly said, if you toss me your keys, Pastor, I'll move your car for you. And I was just not paying attention. You ever do that? And, and I'm standing up on the porch, and I'm going, can I jump off here and not hit the stairs? And I kind of, it was kind of one of those you had to run around the corner to do the jump. And I, for some reason, thought I could do that. How many of you have ever, you know, mistaken your age? <laughs> <laughs> kind of me. Yeah, in this case, it really was me. So, and, and poor man is just like, oh, this is not going to work very well. Yeah, and so I tried, and I, will, I, I did clear the stairs. However, I did not land on the slope very well. And I think everybody thought I broke my leg or my ankle or something when I hit, because I hit hard. I mean, I am literally bruised from here to here. It was just like, what? And it was like, that was a bad example. What was the right thing to do? Yes, Amanda, thank you for your courtesy. Please go move my car. That was the intelligent thing to do, right? Did I give a good example? No. I gave an example of foolish consideration of my age. And, you know, I just, it was not very smart. So can anybody learn anything from my bad example? No? Well, they can. <laughs> what can you learn from my bad example? Don't do it. What not to do? Don't do it again. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Don't ask Pastor to move his car. Don't ask Pastor to move his car. Yeah, that might be, or, you know, offer to take his keys, tie him down, beat him up, whatever you got to do to make sure he doesn't, right? We can learn that. That's not a good jump. Good examples are better than bad examples, but you can learn either way. Here's the example I found. Matthew 14, 25. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you have little faith, why did you doubt? Do you realize that there are several examples, good and bad, here? What's the good example? He had faith to walk. He had faith to walk. How many of you would go, Cool, Jesus, you're walking on the water. It's neat. Let's talk about it when you get in the boat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going for that answer. I'm not a good swimmer, you know? So, so that's it. But he had faith. Whatever his shortcomings were, he said, If you're in this, if you're doing it, 
you call me, I'll go. That's pretty cool. What are the negative examples here? Fear. Got his eyes focused on the waves and the wind and the fact that you don't walk on water normally. Logic. Yeah, fear, logic, click de click de click I'm not supposed to be here. How many of you know that if you are stepping out in faith anywhere, you're probably not supposed to be there by natural rules? Think about it. Think about you going to the doctor and the doctor says, it's terminal, you're done. What you're supposed to do is go home and put your affairs in order, right? Because it's terminal, you're done. That's the logical response. The person that says, thanks doc, appreciate it, but I'm not done. The healer of my body makes all the difference. That's right, man. And you walk out and the healer of your body does make all the difference. And suddenly what the doctor said was utterly impossible is completed. That, that's an example, that's faith, but it's not, it's not where everybody thinks you should be. There's fear, which is a negative example. There's the positive example of Jesus reaching out and grabbing him even in the middle of his mess. Isn't there some grace there? How many of you, if you were Jesus, you'd probably laugh? And then get him out. <laughs> Chuckle anyways. Chuckle anyways, right? It's like, silly boy. Doesn't do that. There are three examples here. Peter steps out. His faith is challenged. Things happen. The rest of the observers see an awesome example that, that I believe has to encourage them in some way. Our example is valuable. But your example can't be seen if you're not plugged into community. How many of you know the example by yourself means nothing? You already know why you did it. You can't be an example to yourself. You already know why you did it. But when you do it in front of other people, and when you see them do it in front of you, you begin to learn. Community matters. We're almost done. How have you noticed that the enemy is not stupid? Do we realize that we do have an enemy to our souls? Yeah. Right? I mean, I realize that there are some people who get really weird about the devil, and they want to ascribe everything to the devil. And the devil is scary, and every time you stub your toe, it's demon activity. And every I don't believe that. How many of you realize that the devil is not infinite? The devil is not the opposite of God. God is all-powerful, the devil is all-powerful. God is all-good, the devil is all-evil. That's not how it works. The devil is a created being and has limits. Now, his limits are far more generous than mine. I mean, he can do things that I can't do in the flesh, but he is not infinite. But he's also not dumb. How many of you have done a job for a while in your life? Whatever that is, I don't care if it's lawn mowing, dishes, brain surgery, whatever it is you do, you've done it for a while. How many of you have noticed you get smarter and better at it as you do it? Tim is selling stuff and all of a sudden he understands, or Bill, you've sold stuff, you right? And you get that look on and, and, and your, your target's face, your client's face. And, and you understand, I, I don't get a grin out of it, and, and you understand you got this deal, right? You have an experience benefit there. Now, the devil has been tempting, distorting, distracting, diverting people for as long as there have been people. So, he's relatively good at it. And if there's one thing he realizes, it's that community makes a difference. That being plugged in to other believers whether they're your little Bible study at work or whether it's your family or whether it's your church family or, you know, being plugged into other people regularly and often makes a difference. See, he is aware of Ecclesiastes 4. Last scripture of the day. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls for he's, he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Do you realize that not only does God know that when he made sure we had it in Scripture, but the enemy knows it too? So the enemy tries to break community in all ways possible. He wants you to be isolated, insulated. He'll use offense, alienation. He'll use too much technology addiction. He'll use anything that he can to get you encapsulated in your own little bubble. 
Because you alone will be unencouraged. You alone will not see the example. You alone will not hear the teaching. You alone will not be accountable to anybody. And that is where we get into trouble. So if he can do anything to split you from your family, split you from your church, split you from your Bible study at work, split you from the Christian ball team you play on, whatever it is, wherever you find those plug-ins, you know, to, that makes it whole and makes it work. If he can get you to not hang with those people or not hang with them very often, he can split you from the benefits that you receive. And he's good at it. Now, don't get me wrong. Do we go through changes in our life that cause the plugins to change? Sure. There was a day which I never did a day of caring. I've done eight or nine of them now. I've chaired three of them. And eventually that will change and I won't do that anymore and we'll do something else, right? We change things. I understand how many of you used to have lots of neighbors that you were really close to and then you moved or they moved and they're not there anymore. And you may not be close to the same group of neighbors ever again. I understand life changes, but we sometimes unplug for reasons that are neither healthy nor productive. Now, if, is it possible to be plugged into nobody? Yes. There are hermetic, you know, people that they just seal themselves in and, and they, they don't talk to anybody. Sadly enough, we have those stories in the news. Happened in Germany a lot, probably while you're over there. These people that die and nobody finds out that they're dead for six months. Find them sitting in their lazy boy in front of the television, which is still on because of the way they pay the bills over there in Germany. And you know, this person's been dead, nobody knows. Is it possible to be that cut off from society? Well, yes, but you're not. I can safely say that you're here. Right? I mean, people like that don't come out much. So, so you're not those people. I'm not those people. I, I get that. We, we have a greater degree of connection than that. So you're going to be connected to somebody. There are other Christians that try to say you should never be connected to any of those bad people out there. And that's just idiotic. How many of you know you can't share the gospel with anybody? You can't be an example of the kingdom of God. You can't share the truth if you have no connections with anybody out there. It's not possible. So you will be plugged into somebody. You will be plugged into neighborhoods and ball teams and community organizations and families and friendships and school you know, classes. And you're going to be plugged into somebody all the time. Now, wouldn't it be nice if the only positives came from faith and there was no negatives on the other side? Right? I can have it or not, have it or not, but I don't have any danger over here. How many of you know that what you plug into still gives you all four of those things? Have you ever been a part of a group that's far from God and they want to hold you accountable to be where they are? You're supposed to believe what they say? You're supposed to accept their worldview? If you plug into that side a lot... You got to plug into it some to share faith, but if that is your main plug, if it's hour after hour at work with people that don't know Jesus, friend after friend that doesn't know Jesus, and that's what you're plugging into, you are getting an accountability surge on that side of the line. And you're not getting much over here. If that's the group you're plugged into, you're getting encouragement from them to do what they're doing and why they're doing it. And you're not getting much over here. You're getting teaching from them why their ideas are right and why these are not. You're getting examples. Do you realize that you're, anybody you plug into, you get those four things, good or bad? So here's the question as we wrap up. If the enemy wants to keep you from connections, and if connections can have such a powerful spiritual effect in your life, what are you doing with yours? Sharing it? Okay, it's good. How are you connecting? I'm not asking you to answer me because I'm not the judge of these things. Aren't you glad that I'm not your judge? <laughs> I don't want that role. Terrible role. But what are we doing with our connections? How do we handle the Bible studies and the prayer groups 
and the believers who are friends that we gather on. Again, I'm making this pretty wide, aren't I? I'm not saying the pew that you sit on in church at such a date, at such a time. That's not the point. I hope that's part of it. In fact, scripturally, that should be part of it. This is part of the community of faith that you share. That's important, but it's not the only one. Are you developing those connections? Are you talking to them more? Are you sharing more of what's inside your heart with them and listening to them as they share what's inside theirs? Or are we living in our bubbles, increasingly focused on our phone and our TV and our computer and, you know, and our offense and our alienation and our sense of I don't fit and I don't belong? Where you plug in determines what you get. Did you buy your heads with me this morning? Since nobody here is plugged into no one, we all have plugins to manage, don't we? How many of you would like to say, I want to make sure that I'm plugged into the right things? I want to make sure I'm plugged into the right things. Okay? Notice that is that is a very general prayer request, isn't it? So we're going to ask, the thing to do is we're going to ask God right now. First question, God help us with that. Lord Jesus, you see our hands. We are people that realize that we're plugged in. We're plugged into groups and organizations and hobbies and habits and activities and teams and companies and so many things. Yes, God, we are. And we're going to get something from everybody that we're plugged in from. But are we plugged into the right things? This isn't a matter that we all have to go home and drop everything and pray for 50 years. No. But Lord Jesus, we may have to ask you right now, check our balance. Who are we plugged into and what are we getting from those connections? What are we giving to those connections? Oh Jesus, you called your people, even your apostles, even your church leaders, you called them to community first. You called them to community before any role, before any ministry, before any manifestation of the Holy Spirit. You, come, you called them into community first. And it was out of that that everything else developed. So God, I ask you that we check today. God, what am, what am I doing with my connections? What am I plugging into on purpose? Because God, just like the day of caring illustration, if we're not plugged into what you want, we won't even notice it. We could drive down the road where any number of projects are going on and not even see them. We could hear worship songs and your Holy Spirit could be hammering on our heart and we could be thinking about the last bad phone call we had with somebody and not thinking at all. We could hear teaching, see examples. God, if we're not plugged into those people, we just miss the point. How many of you know you're plugged into the right things, but you're not sure you're always giving on your connection? Anybody there? You're receiving. You know you're receiving some benefits and some blessings, and that's good. But you're not always sure you're giving back on the same channel. No hands, but I'm getting some nods of heads. Again, Lord Jesus, that's so easy to do. We're so busy, and things can be so hard. And, and Lord Jesus, sometimes it's just easy to pick up the, the gold nuggets on the, the ground ahead of us and, and not really worried about what we're giving out. But God, we can encourage, we can teach, we can hold others accountable, we can be examples. God, I pray that when other people plug into us as part of community, that they get that out of us. That Lord Jesus, we become people who walk with them and live with them and show them those things. Lord Jesus, we want to be people who have the right connection and who sow into those connections as well as receive Lord, you call us to a family that's bigger than us three or four and no more. And so, God, I pray that today we walk in that. Lord, as we open these altars, I just pray that, Lord Jesus, you begin to show us the people to whom we need to be connected. The little disciples group that, Lord Jesus, we can thrive in and help them to thrive too. We ask you to show us that in your creativity and your joy and your strength.